Chapter forty four of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia by Frank Carpenter. Chapter forty four the cape verde and canary archipelagos steaming northward we touch at the island of ascension noted for its enormous green turtles some of which weigh as much as a good-sized jersey cow and then go on north to the cape verde islands situated several hundred miles west of cape verde africa from which they are named the cape verde islands were discovered and colonized by the portuguese in the middle of the fifteenth century and they still belong to them they are nine or ten in number but their total area is not much greater than the area of rhode island they are of volcanic origin most of them being made up of high mountains covered with lava some of the islands are all rock others have patches of rice corn and tobacco cotton and indigo grow wild in the woods our ship stops at st vincent coming to anchor in a little bay half surrounded by volcanic hills how dry and dreary it is there is not a blade of grass to be seen and the brown lava rocks throw back the rays of the sun making it hotter than ever st vincent has no water and its vegetation is so scanty that it would not support a rabbit much less a man still it is the most important of all these islands and we see why when we notice the many ships in the harbor taking on coal st vincent is a great coaling station on the ocean highway to south africa those sheds on the wharves are filled with coal from cardiff wales and that town back of them is occupied chiefly in furnishing coal and other supplies to the steamers there are gangs of negroes at work coaling the ships and we can hear the great lumps as they rattle down into the hold of our ship we next stop at the canary islands opposite morocco the nearest is only sixty-five miles from the mainland and they lie right in the track of ships going from europe to south africa the canaries are volcanic islands rising steeply out of the deep waters of the ocean there are only about seven of them large enough to be considered important and many smaller ones they were discovered by an italian from genoa the same city from which columbus came about two hundred years before the latter discovered america they afterward became the property of spain and are now ruled as one of the provinces of that country the original inhabitants were africans but they have long since disappeared and now almost all the people are spaniards the islands have but a small area in all not much more than two-thirds that of puerto rico and their population is but a few hundred thousand they are very beautiful and their climate is so mild that many people from england and other parts of europe visit them during the winter one of the most striking features of the canaries is mount tenerife whose snow-white peak more than two miles above the sea is visible long before we reach the islands themselves it is on tenerife one of the chief islands of the group that we make our first landing anchoring at the city of santa cruz the capital of the archipelago we seem to be in one of the cities of old spain the houses are of brick and stone covered with stucco painted yellow blue and other bright colors they are close to the streets and some of them surround patios or courtyards the garden often being in the center of the house with rooms all around it some buildings have towers on their roofs where the people sit in the evening enjoying the view we stroll about the narrow streets spelling out the signs over the stores and taking a drive out through the suburbs past the great walled ring used for bullfighting the canaries are noted for their wines and fruits we drive over roads lined with vineyards and orange orchards the rich yellow balls peeping at us out of the trees we stop at one place and buy a dozen ripe juicy oranges for a sum equal to ten cents of our money they are more delicious than any we have tasted at home as they come fresh from the trees riding back we go along hills dotted with fine residences gardens and fields of rich crops the roads are lined with cacti geraniums and roses and we now and then see a patch of nopal plants 
a kind of cactus which is grown to feed an odd little insect which furnishes one of the dye stuffs of commerce have you ever heard of cochineal it is a dye of the most brilliant crimson which may be changed by chemicals to orange red and bright scarlet the dye stuff is made from the dead bodies of the cochineal insects which feed on this plant when the plants are a year old some of the little insects are placed upon them they lay their eggs and in a short time the leaves are covered with tiny white specks which if touched leave a bright crimson stain the insects keep on growing until they cover the plants with what seems to be a white mold soon after this they are scraped off put into boiling water and dried in ovens or on hot plates when dried they look much like grains of buckwheat and are then ready to be shipped to dye factories all over the world returning to santa cruz we take a little steamer which makes a tour of the islands spending a day at las palmas the capital of the grand canary from which the archipelago gets its name the island is famous for the canary birds which originally came from here and which are often found wild we take donkeys and ride about through the country enjoying the people who are very polite the moment we enter a home our host tells us the house is ours and if we admire anything he at once asks us to accept it as a present knowing very well that we shall refuse End of chapter 44chapter forty five of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter forty five the madeiras and the azores las palmas has frequent ships to the madeiras and we have no trouble in getting a vessel which takes us northward to funchal the capital on the island of madeira the chief of the group as we come into its harbour we seem to be entering a vast amphitheatre walled with hills dotted with villas and terraced with gardens orchards and vineyards many little boats manned by half-naked boys put out for our steamer as we come in and the little ones ask us to throw money into the water and let them dive for it we do so and they leap from their boats into the sea following the coins to the bottom and coming up holding them in their hands or teeth they gasp for breath a moment or two and then call out for more as the anchor drops peddlers swarm on the boat offering filigree jewelry embroideries flowers made of feathers and delicious oranges bananas lemons pineapples and pears the people have white skins and they are dressed not unlike europeans they are portuguese the islands being a province of portugal which owns them by right of discovery and colonization going ashore we walk up the cobblestone street to the hotel and later go out into the country much of our travel is upon sledges drawn by bullocks the roads are paved with smooth cobbles and the sleds which have greased runners glide easily over them each team has a boy who goes along in front and a man who walks behind jabbing the animals with a goad to make them go faster coming down the hills the bullocks are sometimes taken out and the runners shoot along as though over snow imagine sliding downhill in the most beautiful may or june weather eating oranges as you go that is one of our experiences in madeira funchal is like a city of portugal its better houses are two three and sometimes more stories high the windows along the streets are barred like a prison and those above have little balconies where the people sit in the evening chatting and enjoying the air the streets are narrow and the cobblestones are hard to our feet people from all parts of europe come here for their health the madeiras have about the finest climate of the world they are also famous for their wines and fruits the same is true of the azores or hawk islands which we visit before going east to the mediterranean sea this archipelago is a little volcanic group of nine inhabited islands 
having less land than a single county of some of our far western states but a soil so good for oranges pineapples and grapes that it supplies europe with its finest tropical fruits there are forty steamers kept busy carrying oranges and pineapples from the azores to the continent and in one year as many as fifty million oranges have been shipped to england alone the resin of a curious tree called the dragon tree is also an article of export the azores are about as far from africa as pittsburgh is distant from the mississippi river and they are almost as far away from portugal to which country they belong they rise abruptly out of the ocean having been forced up by volcanic eruption some of them are little more than volcanoes and one has a crater so low that the water has rushed in and formed a great lake into which boats go through a break in the brim others of the volcanoes are high mount pico the highest of them being more than eight thousand feet above the sea our steamer from madeira carries us over sunny seas there is a whale spouting at the right of the ship and nearer us a school of flying fish skimming over the waves look one has jumped high up and fallen on the deck of our steamer it is like a small mackerel but it has wing-like fins on the forward part of its body each as long as one's hand we see mount pico before we come in sight of the rest of the azores they appear a little later and at the same time the sweet smell of orange blossoms is borne to us on the breeze as we approach the land we can see orchards on the hill with windmills waving their arms above them and below the scattering white villages of the shore we land at ponta delgada the chief city of the archipelago on the island of san miguel the largest of the group and make our way up the street to the hotel what a curious city the buildings are of all the colors of the rainbow the houses and stores are painted rose pink sky blue and bright yellow there are many white houses red houses and houses of brown gray and purple the buildings are close to the sidewalks they have roofs of red tiles and the whole city is a patchwork with as many colors as joseph's coat the natives are portuguese not unlike those of madeira although their dress is very different the better class women wear hoods of blue broadcloth for all the world like gigantic sunbonnets with capes which reach almost to their feet some of the men wear high hats of blue cloth and they have large capes over their shoulders the poorer women have shawls or handkerchiefs about their heads and their dresses are as bright colored as the walls of their houses we take donkeys and ride about through the towns donkeys are used for all sorts of work they carry great loads on their backs they haul carts and are also the chief riding animals each of us has a donkey boy who runs along behind with a long stick or goad in his hand beating the animal when he slackens his pace we find the farming rude in the extreme but the soil is so rich that the islands are of some commercial importance end of chapter forty five Chapter 46 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia, by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 46 The Balearic Isles. We have left the Azores and are passing through the Strait of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean Sea. That great yellow rock on the left, with the guns frowning out of its fortifications, is Gibraltar. It belongs to the English and is a part of the continent of Europe. The ragged, rocky mountains on our right are in Morocco, on the continent of Africa. The sea in front of us reaches on and on for more than 2,000 miles, separating these continents, forming the highways of travel between them. How bright the sun is, and how beautiful and blue is the water! It is rippling under the wind, and thousands of black porpoises are leaping and racing at the front, back, and sides of our vessel. 
they stay with us for hours. We move slowly eastward, and then, turning north, call at the Balearic Islands belonging to Spain. The Balearic Archipelago consists of four principal islands and several smaller ones, formed by the highest parts of a subterranean ridge which here extends far out from the continent. The islands, all told, have an area not much greater than half that of Puerto Rico. The first two we pass are Formentera and Ivisa. They are small and low, but are covered with orchards and vineyards. Farther on is Majorca, the largest of the group, about the size of Rhode Island, and farther still, Menorca, which is next in size. Both are rugged and mountainous, and both are of importance to trade, although not so much so now as in the past. The Balearic Isles were famous in the days of old Rome. They were noted for their slingers, and one Roman general had to put skins over his boats to protect his men from missiles thrown by the natives. During the Middle Ages, these islands were among the chief markets of Europe. They traded with France, Spain, Italy, and Africa, and ships from Asia, loaded with goods brought by caravans from the interior, came across the Mediterranean Sea to Majorca, and there transferred their freight to other vessels bound for the European countries nearby. When the Cape of Good Hope was discovered, Asiatic products were sent south around Africa, and the islands lost this trade. They are now chiefly dependent upon the coasts nearest them. They export oil, almonds, oranges, lemons, and capers to Marseilles, and wine, pigs, and vegetables to Barcelona, and also to Algiers and Italy. Our first stopping place is the beautiful harbor of Palma, the capital of the archipelago. It is a Spanish city of more than 60,000 people, lying right on the sea, and extending up the hills at the back. Not far from the shore is a great cathedral built centuries ago, and on the hills above we can see windmills which remind us of Holland. Here and there palm trees are waving over the houses. The streets are narrow, and the houses not unlike those of Madeira. The people are polite, and we enjoy their quaint costumes, which resemble those of the peasants of some parts of Spain. We gallop on donkeys out into the country through roads lined with thorny cochineal plants and other cacti. There are many orange trees, gnarly olive orchards, smooth-leaved fig trees, and also pomegranates. Much of Majorca is kept like a garden. The soil is as rich as that of California. Single orange trees have produced more than 2,000 oranges in one season, and grapes grow in such luxuriance that one bunch would furnish a lunch for a class of schoolboys. There are also apples, cherries, and peaches, and indeed almost every kind of fruit. End of chapter 46. Recording by Andrea K. Chapter 47 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia, by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 47 Corsica and Elba. After leaving Palma, we sail on to Port Mahone in Menorca, and there take a ship for a yacho on the French island of Corsica. A yacho is the capital of Corsica, and is especially noted because it is the town in which Napoleon was born. The city has several statues to its great hero, and many of its people can explain just why Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo, and are sure that if he had been feeling well that day, he would have been victorious. The Corsicans are a nation of fighters. Their little island is rugged and mountainous and not very rich, but they are proud of their courage and would, it is said, much rather fight than farm. We see children playing soldiers in the streets and notice that the people are rather sober and serious. Most of the women dress in black and the men are grave and reserved. 
Although Corsica belongs to France, its people look more like Italians than Frenchmen. They speak Italian and were for many centuries governed from Italy. In 1768 the island was given over to France, and it is now ruled as a department or province of that country. Corsica is beautiful. Its mountainous character can be seen far out at sea. There are hills about the harbor of Ayacho, and back of them well-wooded mountains, some of which are snow-capped at this time of the year. Some of the valleys have excellent crops. There are many vineyards and fine groves of olives and oranges. After a stroll about Ayacho, we take the train for Bastia, the leading city on the north coast of Corsica, where we find a steamer which lands us in Elba. We have now seen where Napoleon was born, and where he spent his last days and was buried. This little island of Elba is another spot connected with his career. When he was first defeated by the forces of Europe and compelled to give up the French throne, he was allowed to retain the title of emperor and told he could have this little island of Elba as his empire. He was brought here and given a sum of money eight times as much as the salary of our president to support himself and his court. He came here May 4, 1814, but the next February secretly left for France, where he raised another army and marched against his enemies, who finally defeated him at the Battle of Waterloo. Elba now belongs to Italy, being governed as a part of the province nearest it on the mainland. It is only about as large as the District of Columbia, and it has but a few thousand people. The surface of the island is mountainous. There are extensive iron mines, the ore of which is so fine that it is exported to the United States and England for making Bessemer steel. We spend a few hours at Porto Ferraio, the principal city, and then sail southward for the island of Sardinia. End of chapter 47. Recording by Andrea K. Chapter 48 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea K. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia, by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 48. Sardinia and Sicily. The two largest of the Mediterranean islands belong to Italy. They are Sardinia, south of Corsica, larger than Rhode Island and Massachusetts combined, and Sicily, at the toe of the Italian boot, which is much larger still. Both islands are rugged and mountainous, both have rich valleys and plains, and both are inhabited by people of the same race as the Italians. Sicily is the richer and more important, but Sardinia lies right on our route, and we visit it first. Leaving Elba, we sail southward along the coast of Corsica, and then skirt the eastern shores of Sardinia until we reach the end of the island and enter the port of Cagliari, its capital. We are in sight of mountains all the way. They are heavily wooded and capped with fleecy white clouds. Some of the peaks are more than a mile high, and parts of the shore are rugged in the extreme. Our little steamer goes lazily along, and we lean over the rail, watching the land with our field glasses. We can make out the olive orchards and vineyards of the foothills, and are told that the woods higher up contain cork trees, chestnuts, oaks, and pines. Coming into Cagliari Bay, we are in an amphitheater, of which the sea is the floor, and the hills, covered with buildings forming the city, are the encircling tiers. There are many boats and ships in the harbor, for Cagliari is the center of the life and trade of the island. It is a quaint town, with narrow streets which we have to climb to get from one place to another. We land and make our way about through the city. The sidewalks are crowded. All sorts of work goes on in the open air. Here a cobbler is mending boots right out on the street. A little farther on a tailor is sewing, while down in that alley you may see a girl washing clothes. 
there are many peddlers showing their wares, rosy-cheeked children play about in the dirt, and donkeys, dogs, and goats wind their way in and out through the crowd. The people are dark-faced with rosy cheeks. Both men and women wear bright colors, and altogether the scene is a gay one. The better parts of the town are more open. There are many churches, and we frequently see priests and nuns in black or white gowns going about from one church to another. The island of Sardinia is well known in history. The Phoenicians and Carthaginians had settlements upon it, and it was once called the Granary of the Romans. Some parts of it are still fertile, but its lowlands are unhealthful and malarial, and it is of no great importance in the commerce of the Mediterranean. It is different with Sicily, which we are now about to visit. That island produces about one-third of the wine of Italy, half the barley, a large part of the wheat, and nine-tenths of the fruit. It might be called Italy's farm and market garden, and it is so situated that it is one of the chief commercial centers of this part of the world. It is but a short ride by sea from Cagliari to Palermo, the capital. We enter a fine bay guarded by two rugged mountains, and come to anchor in front of the plain in which the city lies. The plain is called La Conca d'Oro, or the shell of gold, because of its fertile soil and its vast orchards of oranges, lemons, and other fruits. Palermo lies right on the bay, under the shadow of the mountains. It is a magnificent town, as large as Washington, with wide streets and many fine buildings. We spend some time in wandering about it, and then take a train for other parts of the island. We visit Messina, a thriving seaport on the northeastern coast just opposite Italy, and near the strait through which the ships go from Genoa and Naples on their way to Egypt and the Indian Ocean. We stop at Catania at the foot of Mount Etna and ride some distance up the mountain, although not to the top. We are now on the highest volcano in Europe. Mount Etna rises far above Vesuvius, and as we look at it, we see that it is covered with snow. The mountain is now smoking, although not an actual eruption, as it has been at many times in the past. In recent times it has often burst forth, throwing out a deluge of hot lava, ashes, and rocks which covered the farms, vineyards, and villages in its course. Much of our time in Sicily is spent in traveling about through the country. The island is a beautiful one, and every step brings a new and strange picture. The land is divided up into large estates, which are rented out to peasants who labor under overseers or perhaps on shares. The peasants live in villages and go out to their work. Their houses are rude, usually built of stone or brick covered with plaster. The people live chiefly on wheat, dried olives, green fruits, and sour cheese, with now and then a bit of pork or goat's flesh. We see goats everywhere. In the cities they are driven from house to house and milked while the customers wait. Do you know what sulfur is? If you do not, you can learn something about it by striking a match or by getting a bit of it at the drug store and lighting it. It is a hard, brittle, yellow substance which gives forth a pale blue flame, the fumes of which will make you cough and almost suffocate you. It is of value in making matches, gunpowder, and medicines, and in many kinds of manufactures. We saw some sulfur in the volcanoes we visited during our tour of the Pacific. There are also sulfur mines here and there in the earth. Mount Etna sometimes vomits forth sulfur mixed with its lava, but the chief supplies of Sicilian sulfur come from sulfur mines far away from the volcano. The sulfur lies in veins in the earth. It is dug out by men and boys, just as our people mine coal. The ore is carried to the surface, and then smelted or otherwise treated to remove the impurities, after which it is shipped to different parts of the world. End of chapter 48 Recording by Andrea K. Chapter 49 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. 
all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter forty nine malta and the grecian isles a few hours by steamer from sicily bring us to malta a rocky little island with smaller islands about it belonging to great britain malta itself is only nine miles wide and twenty miles long but it is valuable because of its excellent harbour at valletta and because it lies almost midway on the route from the strait of gibraltar through the mediterranean sea to the suez canal as we see the island from our steamer it appears to be without vegetation the fields are enclosed in stone walls the hills are terraced with stones and it is only where the orange lemon and olive trees stand out above the walls that green is to be seen there are many ships at the wharves of valletta and we make our way through a crowd of italians english turks greeks and sailors from everywhere up the steep streets to the main part of the city we go along the strada reale the best business street looking at the beautiful maltese lace in the show windows and at the silver filigree work which might almost be called lace in silver we take donkeys and ride out to spend a day with the peasants they have small farms surrounded by stone walls which prevent the land from washing away and also serve to keep out the robbers they live in little houses built of stone with flat roofs and rough doors and windows they cook upon charcoal braziers and their food is scanty and plain the peasants seldom have meat they live mainly on brown bread macaroni olive oil and goat's milk cheese and sometimes fish and fruit they go to work early but rest a couple of hours in the middle of the day and always take a nap after dinner the people are everywhere busy but they are generally ready to stop and chat with us through our interpreter the men are in their shirt sleeves they wear trousers of coarse blue cotton and most of them are barefooted the women dress just as simply having coarse dresses with hood-like mantles which reach to the waist our donkeys are excellent and they trot as fast as ponies the air from the sea is fresh and cool and we enjoy ourselves as we ride from one little farm to another now stopping to eat the blood-red oranges common to malta and now drinking a glass of warm milk fresh from the goat malta is noted for its goats they are excellent milking animals some giving as much as a quart daily every morning the goats are brought from the country into the towns and milked at the doors of the customers from valletta we take ship for the ionian islands off the western and southern coasts of greece calling first at zante not far from the entrance to the gulf of corinth the ionian islands are many in number and seven of them are of some importance they have altogether an area not much larger than the area of rhode island and their population is little more than two hundred thousand only one-third of them are greeks the others being jews and people of the mixed races from the countries about the skies of greece are wonderfully clear the climate is delightful and the soil is so fertile that oranges lemons grapes and other kinds of fruits grow luxuriantly upon the island of zante there are great vineyards devoted to zante currants a seedless grape which is dried and shipped all over the world it is sold in almost every grocery store and we have often eaten it in cakes and plum puddings from zante we go north to corfu an island noted for its beauty and then move around the southern coast of greece to the archipelago in the aegean sea this archipelago consists of many small volcanic islands of which some are little more than rocks of white marble some are almost barren and others have olive orchards and vineyards built in terraces on the sides of the hills the people live in little flat-roofed houses painted white they are mostly greeks or of the mixed race found in this region many of them being sailors and fishermen some of these islands belong to turkey having a population more or less mohammedan while those nearest greece are inhabited chiefly by christians 
of the Greek Catholic Church. End of chapter 49「Chapter fifty of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia by Frank Carpenter. Chapter fifty Crete, Rhodes, and Cyprus coasting southward we call at crete formerly a dependency of turkey but now a part of the kingdom of greece having its representatives in the greek parliament at athens crete is a long narrow island about as big as puerto rico it has a chain of mountains running through it mount ida being two thousand feet higher than mount washington the mountains of crete have numerous caves including one on the slope of mount ida in which the ancient greeks supposed the minotaur lived this was a terrible monster with a human body and the head of a bull which according to tradition ate nothing but human flesh every year so the story goes the king of crete compelled athens to send seven boys and seven girls to be fed to this monster and this continued until a brave young prince named theseus came here and fought the minotaur and cut off his head we call it the town of candia on the northern coast the people are much like those we saw in the grecian islands they have oval faces pointed chins and dark rosy cheeks many of the men wear white shirts blue waistcoats and long boots with their trousers gathered in at the knees some have red fez caps and others wear hoods the chief business of crete is farming and fruit raising the principal products being olives oranges lemons and wines leaving candia we next call at rhodes where we get a ship which takes us to cyprus at the eastern end of the mediterranean sea rhodes has been a very important island in the past and it was once a great commercial centre having trade with egypt asia minor greece and other parts of europe its capital the famous city of rhodes at its northern end was in ancient times one of the finest cities of the world noted for its schools and culture the island formerly belonged to turkey but since the world war it has been under italian control the great city of the past has disappeared and in its place is a town of about thirty thousand people made up of greeks turks armenians jews and italians the island is mountainous with many well-watered valleys it produces wine wax honey lemons oranges and figs and has some manufactures of silks it was upon roads that the famed colossus stood this was a statue as high as a country church steeple put up to the god of the sun in honor of the successful defense of roads about three hundred years before christ the people erected it at the entrance of the port so that it was seen by ships coming in just as the great statue of liberty is seen in the harbor of new york they were years in building it and when completed it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world it was finally destroyed by an earthquake about two hundred twenty four b c and its fragments lay where they fell for almost one thousand years cyprus is the third largest island of the mediterranean as we near it from rhodes it looks like two islands for it has two mountain ranges running along its north and south coasts with a large plain between them as we get nearer the mountains seem to grow in size and the real shape of the island becomes more apparent we steam around the southern side calling first at lemisos and then at larnica the chief port with a very poor harbor we land and make our way through the town and then take horses and ride across country to nicosia the capital we pass many little fields of wheat and barley on our way now and then we see a cotton plantation and up on the hills olive orchards and vineyards farming is the chief business of cyprus although the country is very rough and there is much wasteland cyprus now belongs to great britain being governed by a high commissioner appointed by the king of england the island is noted for its antiquities 
and many statues vases and other curiosities used ages ago have been dug out of the ground and sent to museums all over the world the people are mainly of the greek race and most of them belong to the greek catholic church although some few are mohammedans there are many schools including high schools and several newspapers are published in greek the people elect many of their own officers and fix their own taxes end of chapter fifty chapter fifty one of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty one the west indies general view we have crossed the mediterranean sea have passed out through the strait of gibraltar and are again steaming over the billowy atlantic we are on our way to the west indies that mighty archipelago which beginning about florida in north america extends in a great curve to the mouth of the orinoco river in south america walling in the caribbean sea from the atlantic ocean and gulf of mexico the west indies are among the most important islands of the globe and they are especially interesting to us because their people are our next-door neighbors puerto rico one of the larger islands is an american colony and we have close political and trade interests with cuba the largest and most important island of all let us take a general view of the west indies before we begin to explore them they are divided into three principal groups the bahamas off the southeast coast of florida the greater antilles comprising cuba jamaica haiti and puerto rico with the smaller islands about them south of the bahamas and the lesser antilles which extend from puerto rico to the mouth of the orinoco river with the exception of the bahamas which are low and of coral formation the most of the archipelago is mountainous some parts having active volcanoes the greater and lesser antilles are merely the peaks of a high mountain range which extends far down into the bed of the ocean the mountains are covered with forests the trees of which include mahogany and dye woods the lowlands are largely sugar plantations all the fruits of the tropics grow in profusion and the islands are so beautiful that they are often spoken of as the gems of the ocean the most of them lie in the tropics but they are in the track of the trade winds and the highlands are delightfully cool the archipelago has a rainy season toward the end of the summer and a dry one from december to april while in the early fall there are frequent hurricanes we all know how the west indies were discovered the bahamas were first seen by columbus in fourteen ninety two and during the same year he visited also cuba and haiti he had no idea of our great hemisphere but supposed himself near the coast of india or some part of asia and therefore called the new islands the west indies the greater antilles were colonized by the spaniards and they at first claimed the whole archipelago they were not able to hold the islands however which gradually passed out of their hands cuba is now independent puerto rico and several of the virgin islands are ours and haiti is divided into two republics jamaica the bahamas and some of the lesser antilles belong to the british and other islands are owned by the french and dutch the west indies are bound together with telegraph cables many lines of steamers connect them with one another and with the chief ports of our atlantic and gulf coasts and also with europe we shall have no trouble in making our way from one place to another and shall frequently meet americans who are doing business in the islands End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia by Frank Carpenter 
Chapter fifty two The Lesser Antilles. Our first travels through the West Indies shall be in the Lesser Antilles. We are nearing them now. That island at the front over the prow of the ship is Barbados, belonging to England. It is our first port of call. As we come closer, we can see the coconut trees lining the shores. We observe that the island is of coral formation and we sail carefully to avoid the coral reef through a break in which we enter the harbor of bridgetown the moment our steamer casts anchor it is surrounded by boats filled with negro men and women bringing tropical fruits shells and other things for sale we land and find ourselves in one of the quaintest towns we have yet seen the buildings are of wood or of coral rock many are of two and three stories some have awnings over the streets and we can walk from store to store in the shade how bright everything is and how dusty the white coral roads are dazzling under the sun and we are warned to buy smoked glasses to shield our eyes during our rides over the island see the sugar there are hogsheads and bags of it on the wharves there are barrels of rum and the rich smell of molasses fills the air this little island is one great sugar plantation it is only about twice as large as the district of columbia but it has thousands of acres of sugar fields a large number of sugar mills and some distilleries which make rum barbados is as thickly populated as any island we have visited and the most of its people are negroes the streets are filled with blacks and mulattoes nearly all dressed in white the men wear white shirts and trousers and white straw hats and the women white or colored dresses and bright colored turbans how straight the women are they are come to with bundles on their heads it is this way of carrying things that gives them their erect figures farther on is a black policeman with a white helmet there are black soldiers and black merchants lawyers and doctors this is the case with most of the lesser antilles and also of jamaica and haiti the blacks were brought as slaves from africa to work the sugar plantations they were afterward freed and they now form an important part of the island population and on many of the west indies the most important part the sugar estates of barbados are largely owned by colored people although the island belongs to england and is ruled by a governor sent out from that country leaving barbados we sail for trinidad stopping at kingstown the capital of st vincent and at st george in granada another english island below both granada and st vincent are volcanic they have a rich soil and raise all sorts of tropical fruits including spices and the cacao from which chocolate is made trinidad is the largest of the lesser antilles it is a rectangular island lying so close to the south american continent that we could cross over it in a very few hours it is thickly populated having about three hundred and fifty thousand inhabitants the island is devoted to sugar and among its peoples are eighty five thousand hindus who have come here to work on the sugar estates we see hindus and chinese among the blacks and whites at the wharf of port of spain where we land the vegetation is like that of ceylon and we wonder if we are not off the coast of southern india instead of off south america port of spain is the capital of trinidad it is a well-kept little city with all modern improvements it has places where we can hire automobiles and we ride about over the country visiting the sugar coffee and cacao plantations now we stop to gather flowers and ferns by the roadside now to watch the butterflies which are so beautiful in this part of the world and again to laugh at the monkeys which angrily scold at us out of the trees our most interesting trip from port of spain is to la brea a little peninsula on trinidad about thirty-six miles away upon this peninsula is an asphalt lake whose contents have furnished the pavements of many an american city we have all heard of asphalt and many of us have walked or ridden upon it it is a sort of pitch-like substance mixed with sand which melts when heated but when cold is as hard as stone this stuff can be spread over a road making it perfectly smooth it can be put upon paper or other material and made into roofing or it can be used for walks and floors near la brea in the top of a hill about a hundred thirty feet above the sea 
there is a lake of such pitch it is a mile and a half in circumference and in it there are several million tons of asphalt we go to la brea by sea smelling the pitch as we near the peninsula the beach is coated with hard pitch and there are grayish black pitch pebbles upon it we make our way up the black road to the top of the hill and at last stand on the border of the lake it looks somewhat like a great sheet of asphalt pavement dotted with little islands of grass or stunted trees it has cracks filled with water and in some places gas is coming out we see men on the lake digging pitch and start across it at the center our boots sink in almost to our ankles and we hurry on fearing we may get fast in the pitch and not be able to pull ourselves out nevertheless our feet are comparatively clean there is so much water and oil in the asphalt that it does not stick we take up some and wring the water out of it with our hands and are told we might need it an hour before it would become sticky vast quantities of this asphalt are shipped away every year but the stuff gradually rises and fills the places dug out so that one really does not know how much there is near the lake there are places for purifying the asphalt it is boiled in huge cauldrons and then run off into barrels in which shape it goes to the markets returning to port of spain we are at a loss to know where to go next we might visit tobago a mountainous little island belonging to great britain peopled by negroes or sail along the northern coast of south america to visit curacao belonging to the dutch and other little islands of that region we wish however to continue our explorations of the lesser antilles and hence make our way northward to st lucia belonging to great britain we go by the piton two mighty rocks of the shape of gigantic cones two thousand feet high and call it castries the capital our steamer goes right up to the wharves and we watch the ships taking on coal while we wait the island is volcanic and wild in the extreme castries is an excellent coaling station but otherwise of little importance our next stop is at martinique where we land at fort de france and climb mount pele the terrible volcano which ruined the town of st pierre and a great part of the island a few years ago the volcano is less than a mile high but it periodically bursts forth into awful eruptions which deluge farms and villages destroying multitudes of people martinique has many fertile valleys and its appearance is somewhat like that of tutuila in samoa it belongs to france and is governed by that country although its people are chiefly mulattoes they look much like the natives of barbados save that the women wear dresses of brighter colors and have great hoops in their ears the products are sugar and cacao and the fruits of the tropics from martinique we go north to the british island of dominica so named because columbus discovered it on sunday it is volcanic and is chiefly noted for its sugar farther north still is guadeloupe an island shaped like an hourglass belonging to france and above it the british islands of montserrat antigua nevis and st christopher all small and of little importance on nevis alexander hamilton was born st christopher was named by columbus after his patron saint but it is more often called st kitts kit being the nickname for christopher during our stay there we climb mount misery a half-dead volcano and afterward visit brimstone hill close to the shore which looks as though it had been thrown out of the crater after leaving st kitts we sail northward to visit st john st croix and st thomas three little islands which our government bought of denmark in nineteen sixteen for twenty five million dollars their population is for the most part colored although small the islands are of great value to us because they lie right in the track of vessels running between europe and panama and south america the island of st thomas which has one of the best harbors in the west indies commands one of the chief passages from the atlantic ocean into the caribbean sea and fortifications built there will enable us to prevent any hostile ships from getting through in time of war we pass through a narrow opening into this harbor and land in the little town of st thomas which runs around the shores its houses are of yellow stucco with roofs of red tile they are surrounded by gardens of tropical plants and trees 
we climb the hills above the harbor and looking westward can see our big island of puerto rico which is only about forty miles away we then go back to the harbor and watch the ships taking on coal st thomas is one of the chief coaling stations of the west indies some of the coaling is done by machinery but a great deal is done by colored women bare-armed and barefooted the women sing as they carry great baskets of coal on their heads up the gangplanks into the steamers a little later the steamer toots out its warning to leave and we hurry on board our ship sails to the westward we pass the little islands of vieque and culebra belonging to the united states and in the course of a few hours find ourselves in front of san juan the capital of puerto rico and under the shadow of the dear old american flag end of chapter fifty two chapter fifty three of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty three general view of puerto rico a walk through san juan before we land on puerto rico suppose we take a bird's eye view of the island let us imagine ourselves in a balloon high above it it lies on the sea an almost rectangular mass of rolling blue hills with clouds resting on them and a light green fringe of lowlands bordering the coast the land rises in the centre a mountain ridge running through it from west to east branching out into two spurs not far from the middle so that the ridge has the shape of a pitchfork with a short handle and two long tines there near where the tines come together is el yunque or the anvil that mountain is thirty six hundred feet above the sea and it is the highest point in puerto rico how rugged the hills are they slope up in places like walls making valleys shaped like capital v's with mountain streams running through them descending we observe that everything is covered with green the dark shades on the mountain are fields of coffee tobacco and bananas and the pale green of the low coastal plains is the sugar plantations puerto rico looks large to us from our balloon it is not so in comparison with many of our states you could put ten such islands into indiana and it would take two of them to cover new jersey its average width is only a little greater than the distance from washington to baltimore and its length not much more than from baltimore to philadelphia if puerto rico were level we could walk from one end of it to the other in three days and we could cross it in one how thickly the island is settled we can see houses everywhere through our field glasses there are villages along the coast and in the valleys and huts shine out of the trees on the tops of the mountains there are but few large cities the most important ports are san juan the capital on the north coast and mayaguez and ponce on the west and south both thriving commercial centers smaller places are arecibo and aguadilla situated on the north and west coast and guayama and umacao on the south and east the island of puerto rico contains a large population it has more than a million people it is more thickly settled than any of the west indies except barbados and that any of our states except massachusetts and rhode island but let us come down to earth and take a walk through san juan we are on the streets of our puerto rican capital how unlike our cities at home the town is situated on a little island not far from the middle of the north coast and connected with it by bridges there is a huge wall about the older part of the city and a castle on a hill at one corner guarding the harbor there are other large houses here and there which belonged to spain but are now used by uncle sam's officers and the rest of the buildings are two and three storied structures packed close together along narrow streets which cut each other at right angles with a plaza or square in the centre the buildings are of brick covered with stucco painted in the brightest of colours sky blue rose pink brown red and yellow the roofs are of red tiles 
there is but little window glass the window openings being covered by heavy green shutters which by day are thrown back so that you can see all that goes on within here a woman is combing her hair there one is washing across the street a girl is sewing on a hand sewing machine which rests on her lap while about her feet two little brown babies are rolling many of the houses have balconies extending out over the sidewalk and in the evening these form the sitting place of the family on some streets the ground floors are given up to small stores which look more like caves than like our mercantile establishments there are however other rooms farther back the goods on the shelves being merely samples of those kept in the rear the business signs are spanish and the names upon them give no indication of their owners nor of the goods sold within here for instance is a dry goods store with the words la perla or the pearl above it next door is one selling hardware labeled the golden rooster while down that side street is a shop called la nina or the girl that sells gentlemen's furnishing goods what a strange crowd the streets swarm with people most of them the descendants of spaniards who settled the island long ago we see many mulattoes and now and then a negro there are also people from the united states and some spaniards the most of the natives dress in light clothing the men wear straw hats and white linen suits and the women light dresses the poor are barefooted and many of the women bareheaded how noisy it is from the second-story windows come the drum of the piano and the twang of the guitar hucksters are crying their wares goats run in and out of the houses carriages drawn by ponies dash by and the scenes are as busy as any we have witnessed since we left home we make our way on to the market passing peddlers of every description here is one selling chickens he has three dozen fowls tied together by their legs and slung on each side his shoulder and he calls out the prices in spanish the chickens squawk as he goes behind him is a man with bundles of palm bark under his arms there are feathers sticking out of the bundles and as he turns around we see that each contains a live turkey laid flat and thus tied up for sale farther on are men selling eggs and farther still ice peddlers and candy peddlers and a boy carrying a great basket of bread on his head the chief market is held inside a court it has vegetables and tropical fruits as well as meats and fish of all kinds one section is devoted to dried beef which the natives stew and eat with their rice another article sold is salt cod which is used all over the country leaving the market we pay a visit to some of our puerto rican cousins in their homes we have brought letters of introduction and are heartily welcomed our friends are well to do and we find that they live quite as comfortably as we do in america they dwell on the second floor of the houses the ground floor being given up to the servants and stables we often pass by horses and carriages as we go up the wide stairs to the living apartments the rooms above are large and airy they have great windows opening out upon galleries or balconies where one can sit in the cool of the evening our friends are fond of music and we hear pianos and organs in almost every home later on we see something of the poorer people finding many living in one or two rooms some families have but one bed and the children sleep on the floor puerto rico was terribly oppressed before the united states took possession of it and the lower classes although they are now much better off are still poor there are many beggars on the island and in the city there is one day of the week when beggars are permitted to go about asking alms this is usually saturday then every merchant and business man expects such a call and prepares a pile of cents for them the beggars call one by one each is supposed to take one cent and no more and to go away blessing the giver before leaving san juan we call at the palace to see the governor and then visit the legislature puerto rico is now ruled by a governor and an executive council appointed for a term of four years by the president of the united states and a house of thirty-five delegates it has also a resident commissioner to the united states who has a seat in our congress the delegates and the commissioner are elected every two years by the people local laws are made by the council and the delegates 
Puerto Rico has greatly improved since it became an American colony. There are schools everywhere, and all the school children learn English. The island has railroads and fine wagon roads, and it is rapidly growing in civilization and wealth. End of chapter 53chapter fifty four of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty four across puerto rico we leave san juan this morning for a trip across puerto rico we have automobiles and we spin along uphill and down going as fast or as slow as we please now we stop to chat with the people now to lunch at a village and now to visit a coffee tobacco or sugar plantation how delightful it is the road is as hard as stone and as smooth as a floor it is the military road built long ago by the spaniards and is famous as one of the best roads of the world since we took the island roads like it have been built everywhere and we can go to almost any part of puerto rico in our motor cars this road begins at san juan the capital and covers eighty-one miles in crossing the mountains to ponce the chief port on the south side of the island although as the crow flies the two towns are only about half that distance apart how the road winds as it goes up the mountain now it seems to cling to the sides of a precipice and we have great walls of green above and below us now we are climbing the hills and now coasting down to the valleys at times we can see the road both above and below us and it seems impossible that we could ever climb to the top the scenery is wonderfully beautiful we pass through the sugar plantations of the coast going by coconut groves and other strange palms now we stop at a field of bananas the plants are twenty feet high and their soft green leaves are each as tall as a man their blossoms are as large as an ear of popcorn and those in full bloom are blood red as we wait a man goes by with the mule load of oranges the animal has two baskets each holding three bushels slung over its back we ask the price of the fruit the man tells us that the oranges are especially fine and that he could not possibly sell more than three for a cent we buy a couple of hundred each of us storing a dozen or so in his automobile to eat on the way the oranges are full of juice and deliciously sweet we eat them after the puerto rican style cutting off the yellow outside skin leaving only the white we then slice off the top and suck out the juice it is fit for a king higher still we come into the coffee plantations for which puerto rico is noted the trees are in blossom and the air is loaded with the sweet perfume puerto rico raises some of the best coffee of the world and coffee grows well on all the higher parts of the island we cut coffee sticks for canes and then fly along through fields of tobacco stopping to look at the sheds where the leaves are dried and cured for the market the tobacco fields run up and down the hills the plants are of a dark green color with enormous leaves which grow on all sides of the stalk as we go on with our ride the beauties of puerto rico grow upon us we have seen most of the islands of the globe but there is none more beautiful than this it is like switzerland without the ice and snow and it has many beauties which switzerland has not the mountains are green and clouds rest on their tops many peaks are hidden in fleecy white masses and little white clouds nestle here and there on the slopes the air is moist the breeze tempers the rays of the sun and the heat seems just right now and then we pass through the woods the trees are those of the tropics with long green vines or silver gray moss hanging down from the branches some trees have orchids clinging to them others have masses of red yellow or purple blossoms making them look like enormous bouquets while others are covered with balls of white wool the latter are cotton trees the cotton bursting forth from the bowls just as it does in the plants of our southern states and then the ferns they are of every description from the exquisite maidenhair close to the ground to the great tree 
as high as a two-storied house with enormous branches as fine as the most delicate lace all along the way we meet people traveling or bringing goods down to the ports some are on puerto rican ponies others in carriages and others on foot we go by great carts loaded with tobacco and coffee and hauled by oxen from two to twelve being yoked to each cart the yokes are not fastened about the necks as with us they rest back of the horns and are tied there by ropes so that the oxen pull with their horns and heads and not with their necks and shoulders as at home much freight is carried upon the little ponies for which the island is noted we pass several caravans of the kind each pony having a pack on its back and sometimes a man on top of the pack the man sits with his feet on each side of the pony's neck and rides almost as comfortably as in a chair many of the hills are covered with grass and upon some of them fat cattle are feeding some fields are fenced with barbed wire others have hedges of wild pineapples the leaves of these are so sharp that one cannot crawl over them and the animals will not break through there are no farmhouses and barns such as we have now and then we see the home of a planter a building made of boards with holes in the walls for windows and stairs reaching from the ground to the first floor the houses are built high upon posts and as in san juan the well-to-do people live upstairs the climate is such that cattle and horses feed out of doors all the year round it is never cold and there is always good pasture the homes of the poor are to be seen everywhere along the road and off in the fields they are little shacks made of boards or palm bark so mean that they would hardly do for a cow stable at home some have a framework of poles to which are tied palm leaves making the walls and roof the floors are of poles and the roof is so thin that the rain often drops through we stop at a hut and look in it has but one room there are no windows and the only light comes through the door which is made of palm leaves and so hung that it can be lifted aside during the day the people sleep on the floor the cooking is done in a little lean-to at the back upon a fire bed of earth the pot being raised upon stones above the coals the poor people live upon little their chief food is bananas of which it takes many to satisfy hunger the small children have their stomachs so stretched from such eating that they seem deformed such stomachs are sometimes called banana stomachs our little puerto rican cousins of the interior are scantily clothed but they are nice little children and they laugh and wave their hands at us as we pass they seem to be happy and we notice that their parents are kind to them and apparently love them as much as our parents do us we go through villages of thatched huts seeing now and then one which has a few buildings similar to the smaller houses of san juan the ordinary village consists of a public square with a big church facing it several houses of stucco and wood and many thatched huts the houses are built close together each has a door and some holes for windows but no glass we can see in as we go by there is almost no furniture in some houses hammocks take the place of beds the people stand in the doorways and look at us as we fly by they are dressed in white or colored cotton many of the women are bareheaded and all are barefooted some have naked babies in their arms and naked children fly out of the streets to escape our automobiles now we are over the mountains and going down the opposite slope the south side of the island is drier because the trade winds from the north which bring the rain first strike the other side of the mountains and the cold air squeezes out most of the moisture this is so in all the west indies the northern sides being the rainier the latter part of our journey is downhill but the slope is so gentle in places that we release the brakes and let our machines fly over the road without using the motors to carry them onward farther on we come to the lowlands and are again in the great belt of sugar-cane which almost encircles puerto rico the black earth is covered with a rich growth of pale green we pass many sugar factories their smokestacks leaning as it were against the blue sky and we see gangs of men at work cutting the cane at last we reach ponce 
the commercial center of this side of the island it is a flat spanish-built town of one and two-storied houses covered with stucco and painted in the brightest of colors it lies about five miles from the harbor where we can get ships that will take us to haiti before leaving however we spend some time making excursions by sea to the islets about puerto rico and on pony back to different parts of the mainland the chief islets are vieque and calibra which we passed on our way from st thomas to san juan and the caja de muertos or chest of the dead off the south coast and mona island near the west coast both noted for their phosphate deposits the only habitable island is vieque it is a mountain ridge twenty one miles long and six miles wide it has several sugar plantations along the coast and its hills form excellent pastures our trip over puerto rico shows us that it is wonderfully rich it produces all kinds of vegetables and some parts of it are especially good for sugar tobacco and coffee there are farms not far from ponce which raise enormous pineapples the orange tree grows everywhere and it is never disturbed by jack frost along the coast are millions of coconut trees and farther back are pastures upon which feed the finest of cattle there are now fast steamers from san juan to new york and many hundreds of thousands of oranges grapefruits and pineapples are annually shipped by the puerto ricans to us we import also vast quantities of their tobacco and sugar and we sell them almost all the foreign goods that they buy this trade now amounts to many millions of dollars a year end of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty five haiti the island of the two black republics our next journey is to a country where most of the people are negroes it is the island of haiti comprising the two countries of haiti and the dominican republic both of which have a republican form of government with black presidents and other officials it takes us less than a day to steam from ponce to the town of santo domingo on the southern coast of the island we sail westward cross the mona passage and are soon coasting along the shores of what appears to be a huge mass of mountains rising steeply from the water and jumbled together in all sorts of shapes one of the early explorers on his return to england was asked by the king what haiti was like in reply he took a sheet of paper crushed it up in his hands until it was a mass of wrinkles and then threw it down upon the table haiti is like that your majesty said he all mountains and valleys and so it is the mountains run in four ranges from west to east with valleys and plains between them their peaks are the highest of the west indies they are in fact the summits of the subterranean ridge which extending above the water forms the chief islands of this archipelago with the glass we can see the highest mountain from our boat it is loma tina not far from santo domingo almost two miles in height the mountains are not unlike those of puerto rico as we saw them from the sea save that they are more rugged and grander they are heavily wooded with dense thickets of ferns on the summits there are clouds resting upon them as we sail along the coast and we can see fleecy masses of vapor nestling here and there in the green laps of the hills it is on the mountain tops that the rainfall is heaviest for there the air is coldest and it wrings the most water from the trade winds these winds blow against the northern side of the island and therefore that side has plenty of rain while on the south side the lower slopes have not quite enough there are many rivers however and on the whole the island is fairly well watered haiti is naturally rich sugar cane grows upon it as well as anywhere in the west indies and coffee tobacco and cacao thrive on the slopes of the mountains its forests are especially fine including mahogany cedar and dye woods 
and in the mountains there are rich deposits of iron copper and gold all tropical fruits grow here as well as in puerto rico and the country might be a great garden if its people were as industrious as we are considering its natural resources one would expect to find that the natives were exceedingly prosperous they are just the reverse let us examine into their history and see if we can tell why haiti was one of the first islands discovered by columbus and the very first to be colonized when columbus landed upon it in fourteen ninety two he described it as like the most beautiful provinces of spain and the indians as excellent people speaking of it to the king and queen of spain he said i swear to your majesties there is not in the world a better land nor a better people they love their neighbors as themselves and their discourse is ever sweet and gentle each sentence accompanied with a smile although it is true that they are naked yet their manners are decorous and praiseworthy the next year after this some spanish settlers came to the island and founded a colony they at once began to oppress the natives and to enslave them they forced them to work in the mines and on their plantations and when the natives objected they beat them or killed them columbus estimated that there were a million natives in haiti at the time of his landing but the spaniards treated them so badly that within less than fifty years they had all disappeared after that haiti was almost deserted the plantations which had been cultivated by the indian slaves were neglected and the cattle hogs and dogs ran wild a little later the buccaneers some bands of french pirates who had settled on the island of tortuga off the western end of haiti gradually came across and took possession of that part of the country importing negro slaves to work their plantations this was also done by the spaniards and other parts of the island and within a few years the most of the population was negro the western part of haiti through these buccaneers became a french possession and when in the later part of the eighteenth century the french people overthrew their kings in the great revolution and established a republic they declared that the slaves of haiti should be free the french republic of that time was overthrown by napoleon bonaparte who made himself emperor napoleon did not believe in freedom and he ordered that the negroes of haiti be brought back into slavery they refused to submit and fought for their liberty in a war which ended in the success of the negroes and the establishment of a negro republic with negro officers and with laws prohibiting any white man from owning land this was early in the last century when the united states was still a young nation since that time the western part of haiti has had frequent changes of government it has had negro emperors kings and presidents but no white rulers it has had many revolutions but in recent years it has been a republic and so we find it today the eastern part of the island where we now are was governed by spain about three hundred years slaves were also introduced here but many of them married into the families of their masters and with the few indians who were left so that the population is now made up of negroes and of spanish and indian mulattoes for a time this part of the island was part of the republic of haiti but in eighteen forty four it became independent under the name of the dominican republic or santo domingo each country has a form of government much like ours with a congress and officials elected by the people each has its president but the president of the dominican republic is chosen by popular vote while the president of haiti is elected by congress in both countries the blacks own the lands and do most of the business but santo domingo the capital of the dominican republic lies just before us we can see the spire of the cathedral reaching high above the city wall the town is like a city of the middle ages it was planned by columbus and that very wall was built centuries ago we land and with a mulatto guide who speaks english take a walk through the streets how shabby and dirty everything is the houses are of spanish style with immense doors and windows they are close to the sidewalks and we can look in as we go along the streets some are built around courts so that they appear to have a garden inside the house the walls are of the brightest colors and the black and yellow people standing against them 
furnish splendid subjects for our cameras in the suburbs are mud huts thatched with straw or palm leaves with poorly dressed men and women and half-naked babies there is little work going on and all seem shiftless and lazy there are negroes everywhere we see them sitting on the sidewalks on the doorsteps and standing in groups here and there smoking and chatting the language is spanish the people have the manners of spain and every one is very polite we visit the cathedral where some of the family of columbus are buried and then go to the government offices the officials tell us that the dominican republic comprises about two-thirds of the island it has an area of eighteen thousand square miles and just about as many people as st louis there are no large cities the chief town having only ten thousand inhabitants this is santiago situated in a rich valley north of the central part of the country and connected with the harbor of puerto plata the principal port on the north coast leaving santo domingo by steamer we make our way along the southern coast of the island to its western end and turning north and then east pass into the gulf of gonaive and come to anchor at port-au-prince the capital of the haitian republic port-au-prince is much larger and more prosperous than the town of santo domingo it has over one hundred thousand people and we can see from the ships in the harbor that it has considerable trade haiti exports a great deal of coffee sugar and cotton it produces everything raised in the tropics and also some fruits of the temperate zone such as peaches strawberries and blackberries as we go through the streets we meet but few whites the chief merchants lawyers and doctors are colored there are colored policemen colored soldiers and colored customs officials all dressed in gay uniforms the republic has about two million inhabitants and of these nearly all are of african descent how well dressed some of the black people are and how fine they look the men are straight tall and well formed they are polite and we are surprised to observe that most of them speak only french they speak it well too many children of the better classes are sent to paris to be educated and french is the language of the schools it is also used in the government offices and in the stores the poorer people speak a mixture of french and the native language port-au-prince has wide streets which cross one another at right angles it has some stone and brick houses and many of wood on the edge of the city are villas with palms and other trees about them and in the town business buildings and large frame structures containing the government offices we take carriages for a drive out into the country our black coachman takes us rapidly through the dust up hill and down we go by many small farms and now and then a large estate owned by a black along the road are cabins or shacks in which the poor people live many of them are shiftless and live from hand to mouth in the far interior the people are ignorant and superstitious and in the mountains some are said to be almost as barbarous as the savages of central africa they believe in witches and spirits and it is charged that they sometimes have human sacrifices end of chapter fifty five chapter fifty six of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty six jamaica we are still in a land of the blacks jamaica is a british possession but its people are almost all negroes it was discovered by columbus about two years after he had first set foot upon these islands it was settled by the spaniards who held it for about a century and a half when the british took possession of it by conquest the spaniards oppressed the indians so that they all died off and at the time the british came the island was almost deserted the british soon began to see the value of jamaica for sugar and they set out plantations importing negro slaves by the thousands to work them there were more than three hundred thousand slaves here at the beginning of the last century at which time the slave trade was abolished 
and after that the freed slaves and their children form the most of the population there are about a million people in the island of jamaica and of these all but a few thousand are colored there are fifteen thousand whites and also about fifteen thousand east indians who have been brought in to work upon the plantations let us take a look at the map and see what a valuable position jamaica has in the caribbean sea it is just south of the windward passage between cuba and haiti where almost all the ships going between the panama canal and europe and also between the canal and our atlantic states must pass the island has excellent harbors and it is so situated that vessels can stop here on their way for coal and supplies the principal harbor is port royal in front of kingston the capital where we now are the water is so deep here that the largest ocean steamers can call there at our right is a ship bound for boston with a cargo of oranges bananas and pineapples and on the left one is coming in from england with goods for the natives it will probably take back sugar coffee ginger and other native products jamaica is by no means small it is larger than puerto rico and is the largest of the british possessions in this archipelago the island has great natural resources it is mountainous but the vegetation extends to the highest peaks and there are many rich valleys and coastal plains devoted to sugar fine coffee is raised on the highlands and tropical fruits are found almost everywhere fruit pays better than anything else oranges bananas and pineapples being annually exported to the united states jamaica has orchards of cacao nutmeg cinnamon and allspice trees the allspice is an evergreen tree which grows to the height of thirty feet it has berries about the size of a pea each of which contains two round dark brown seeds which taste like nutmegs cinnamon and cloves ground up together the berries are picked green and dried in the sun after which they look like black pepper they are valuable for flavoring pickles pastry and cake another export is ginger this plant is grown in small patches the roots are broken up and set out much like potatoes they sprout rapidly sending out stalks covered with leaves from one to three feet in height when the stalks are withered the new roots are fully grown and ready for digging they are taken out cleaned and scalded in boiling water after this they are spread out in the sun to dry and then packed up for export to our country and europe ginger is valuable for medicine for making preserves and also for the gingerbread cookies and snaps we all like so much we enjoy our travels in jamaica every one speaks english and we can stop and talk to the colored boys and girls wherever we go we stay one day in kingston taking a carriage and driving about the town many of its houses are of yellow brick with stores on the ground floors and high steps leading to the second stories where most of the people live we drive out to the parade ground to watch the drill the soldiers are fine-looking colored men wearing red turbans white jackets and blue trousers like all english islands jamaica is well governed and its larger cities have modern improvements kingston has electric lights and an electric railroad and it is connected with all parts of the island by telegraph jamaica has one thousand government schools where children are taught free it has short railroads and good country roads we can go by carriage to any part of it and on horseback to the very tops of the mountains one of our pleasantest experiences is such an excursion we leave kingston and ride through sugar plantations past many small farms including fields of bananas and coffee and then climb up the hills into the clouds the higher summits of the blue mountains are always veiled in clouds there are little clouds on their sides through which we sometimes ride coming out to find the sun shining brightly on the other side the views are magnificent as we ascend we can see the caribbean sea far below us with the ocean steamers going in and out of port royal apparently no larger than canoes the buildings of kingston now look like toys and the little farm huts are mere spots on the landscape the vegetation changes as we go upward in the lowlands are groves of coconut palms higher up there are forests with many orchids 
and long hanging creepers while on the top are fern beds and groves of tree ferns at this altitude most mountains are barren but here the moisture is so great that everything is the greenest of green now we have descended the mountains and are again in the lowlands we stop at a cabin made of mud with a thatched roof and talk with the people they are negroes as jolly and good-natured as are negroes at home the children bring oranges and bananas and ask us to buy there are many women at work in the fields and in some places we observe them breaking stones on the road they seem to do more work than the men they cut sugar cane hoe corn and carry great bundles as we return to the city we see many women bringing fruit and vegetables into kingston on donkeys and on their heads we visit the market to get a supply of fresh fruit before going on board here most of the peddlers are women and it is a woman porter who carries our pineapples bananas and oranges to the ship she puts the whole in a basket which she lifts to the top of her head and goes off on a trot we follow behind and in a short time are again on the steamer ready for our voyage to cuba end of chapter fifty six chapter fifty seven of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter fifty seven cuba the pearl of the antilles we are now to visit the largest richest and most valuable island of the west indies an island which the spaniards call the pearl of the antilles and one so important to us that we have to a certain extent taken it under our protection this is cuba so situated that it commands the two entrances to the gulf of mexico by the strait of florida and the yucatan channel and also the windward passage which is the chief entrance from the atlantic ocean to the caribbean sea if the entrances to the gulf were shut off it would disturb the commerce of our southern states and of the whole mississippi valley and the closing of the windward passage would be of great damage to our trade with south america and that which comes by way of the isthmus of panama cuba is so important to the united states that in our treaty relations we have provided that the island shall never make any agreement with any foreign power which might endanger its independence that it shall not incur foreign debts beyond what its current revenues can easily pay and that it shall not do anything that might affect us or our trade we have also the right to establish naval stations on the island and on the whole our relations with it are such that although it is an independent republic it is generally looked upon as a dependency of the united states and many think that it will some day ask to be admitted to the union notice the shape of the island as it lies on the map the spaniards compared it to a bird's tongue with the root in the caribbean sea and the tip just licking the yucatan channel how long and how narrow it is and how winding its coast if the coastline could be stretched out it would be longer than the distance from boston to san francisco and back and on every part of it there are excellent harbors so that it is easy to export the products by sea now look again at the map cuba is like a cornucopia or horn of plenty and this word just describes it it is the most fertile of all the west indies it has no deserts no barren hills and only a few large swamps much of it is still wild but almost the whole can be tilled the eastern part is mountainous but the mountains are green to their tops and they have valuable forests and minerals the middle is made up of gently sloping plains upon which are the largest and richest sugar fields of the world and in the west are picturesque mountains with beautiful valleys where is produced the finest tobacco known to man the whole island is covered with a luxuriant vegetation it has more than three thousand native plants and millions of acres of valuable forests it has twenty-six varieties of palms the finest of mahogany and dye woods 
and also trees bearing tropical fruits there are flowers everywhere and beautiful birds including different varieties of parrots are found in the woods is it any wonder that the spaniards thought it a jewel cuba was discovered by columbus and settled by the spaniards when columbus first came it had several hundred thousand indians ruled by nine independent chiefs the indians had slight forms and pleasant faces and the explorers said they were a good people they were gentle and friendly they had huts as well built as those of the poorer cubans of to-day and near them little farms where they cultivated cotton pineapples tobacco manioc and indian corn the spaniards enslaved them and treated them so cruelly that they soon disappeared after that negro slaves were imported to take the place of the indians about a million negroes being brought over from africa for this purpose then the slaves were freed and they with their descendants form a large part of the population of the island today cuba has now more than two and one half million people including whites blacks and mulattoes the whites are mostly the descendants of the spaniards there are more of them than any of the others and they form the ruling class owning most of the land they include emigrants from spain and other parts of southern europe and also americans germans english and french the blacks are the descendants of the slaves and the mulattoes come from the negroes who have intermarried with the whites and also with the chinese who were brought in years ago to work on the plantations many of the whites are wealthy and well educated some are graduates of the best of our colleges and others have studied in europe spanish is the language used everywhere but many of the people speak english as well and we shall have no trouble in travelling about we leave port royal in the morning and shortly after dinner get our first sight of cuba there are coconut trees lining the shore and behind them are great mountains rolling one over the other their tops in the clouds we make our way slowly along between haiti and cuba sailing over the very spot where our fleet conquered that of spain during the spanish-american war and staying for a few hours at santiago we can see nothing of santiago until we come into the harbor the channel is narrow and we have to wind this way and that to get through we cross the place where hobson sank the merrimac go by moro castle a great fort on a bluff at the right and finally anchor in front of a city of white buildings with roofs of red tiles backed by smoky blue mountains it is santiago the chief city of eastern cuba the buildings are small and of the spanish style making us think of madeira they are usually of one or two stories close to the street with walls painted in all the colors of the rainbow many of them have large windows with iron bars so that they look much like prisons they have heavy barred doors we shop a while at the stores and then return to the wharves where we watch the ships taking on copper and iron ore from the mountains near by the ore is brought by train and boat to santiago and thence exported to the united states and europe we are still looking on when the steamer whistles its warning to leave we hurry on board and soon find ourselves out at sea some distance from land we sail for a time in a northeasterly direction and then rounding cape Maisy turn to the northwest and steam along until at last we come to the port of havana end of chapter fifty seven chapter fifty eight of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia, by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 58 Havana. We are in Havana, a city of over 300,000, situated on a plain about a beautiful harbor. It is the capital of Cuba and the largest city of the West Indies. How gay everything is! The tropical sun beats down upon the bright colored houses its rays are dancing on the roofs of red tiles and on walls of red sky blue rose pink and cream yellow dazzling our eyes and making us think of a kaleidoscope rather than a great business city 
we land and make our way through one narrow street after another we go through the prado in the centre of which is a wide promenade with two rows of trees on each side where the people walk in the cool of the evening here and there are squares or plazas filled with trees with seats under them on which people are sitting we pass many fine buildings including the government palace the cathedral the theatre and the large hotels the most of the buildings are low one-storied structures although in the best business and residence sections we find some of two and three stories the houses are made of great blocks of stone covered with stucco they have enormous doors and windows some so barred with iron that the people behind them appear to be looking out of a prison they are of the spanish order each house built around a court or patio which contains plants and flowers and sometimes a fountain it is in the patios that the people sit and chat in the cool of the evening the rooms are large and the ceilings high the floors are of marble bricks or porcelain tiles it is so warm in havana that great care is taken to keep cool we spend some time in the stores they open out on the street the whole front in some cases being taken away during the daytime so that they remind us of the bazaars we saw in the far eastern islands there are but few large establishments such as we have at home although many stores which look small have warehouses behind packed with fine goods only a few of us speak spanish and although there are many americans in havana it is necessary to have an interpreter to make ourselves understood the cubans are polite and the moment they learn we are americans they are more polite than ever for they look upon us as their brothers and sisters the united states buys far more of their products than any other country and in return the cubans purchase from us much of their food clothing machinery farm tools and other things most of our explorations are in the morning and evening for we adopt cuban customs during our stay for instance it would be foolish to try to do business at noon for at that time the stores and business places are shut the cubans take only a cup of coffee a roll and perhaps some fruit upon rising they do not have a substantial breakfast until about eleven o'clock after which they enjoy a nap or a chat with their friends not returning to work until one o'clock or possibly later their dinners are much like ours and are served in the evening when the day's work is over after dinner they walk or drive out or stay at home with their families sitting on the balconies or in the patios enjoying the air we have friends in havana and through them meet some of the better class people their homes are beautifully furnished and quite as comfortable as our own our friends speak spanish english and french and through them we learn that many cubans are sent to the united states or europe to be educated this is so notwithstanding there are now good schools in havana and common schools almost everywhere throughout cuba a large number having been established since the spanish-american war havana has colleges and a university and it has girls schools of all kinds many of the lower classes are still very ignorant and comparatively few can read and write they are improving however and now that they are free their condition will grow better and better we enjoy our strolls about the city by moonlight there are thousands in the plazas on the streets and in the cafes there are gay carriages and men upon horseback the cubans are fond of music and we hear pianos guitars and singing almost everywhere on sunday we go to the cathedral the women present are dressed in black with black lace shawls called mantillas wrapped around their heads and falling down over their shoulders black is the color used by the women of the better classes on the streets although they wear all sorts of gay colors at home we spend one morning in the market and find it crowded with all sorts of people buying and selling there are a thousand different stalls and many thousand customers we count eighty different kinds of game twenty varieties of potatoes and sweet potatoes and then go on to the tropical fruits which are sold in large quantities we buy a ripe pineapple for five cents eat bananas which almost melt in our mouths and orange after orange until we cannot eat more 
we have tasted cuban oranges before and have learned to eat them as the cubans do we find them for sale on every street corner and the peddler fixes the fruit for us he pairs off the skin with a sharp knife much as we pare an apple taking off every white particle and just breaking the little globules within he then sticks a fork into the orange and hands it to us we suck out the juice rolling the oranges around as we do so this is the way our oranges are served with every breakfast we like it so well we shall advise our friends to try it at home before leaving havana we visit the president and vice president and also the senate and house of representatives cuba is now a republic the country is divided into six provinces or states and its people elect their own officers we learnt that it is far better off than it was under the spaniards the cities are cleaner and more healthful new railroads are being built the wild lands are being reclaimed and the people are improving in civilization and wealth End of chapter 58Chapter 59 of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Australia by Frank Carpenter. Chapter 59 On the Sugar and Tobacco Plantations we have left havana and are slowly making our way through some of the country districts of cuba we have visited all the large cities we have stayed a while at matanzas and cardenas important sugar ports on the north coast east of havana and crossed the island to the great sugar market at cienfuegos on the south we rested a while at santa clara and camagüey thriving cities on the central plain and are now going back to havana what a beautiful island this is and how rich the soil outside havana we saw acres of pineapples the great red balls sprouting out of the earth surrounded by long prickly green leaves we have ridden through fields of banana trees loaded with fruit and everywhere we go there are great palms standing out alone on the landscape or forming the avenues to some rich planter's house cuba has twenty-six varieties of palm trees including the royal palm the most beautiful known to man and the coconut palm whose green nuts give us a drink every time we ride through the country there are pastures on which fat cattle are feeding and many sugar plantations central cuba is little more than a vast sugar estate divided up into large and small farms here they are ploughing the fields with machine ploughs and there the same work is done by oxen which pull the ploughs along by yokes attached to their horns there are thousands of colored people at work we see them planting the cane just as in hawaii and java but are told that the soil is so rich here that the planting need be done only once every five or six years and that if the cane be properly cut a new crop will sprout out from the old stalks even longer cuba is said to have better sugar soil than any other country the land is not fertilized but nevertheless it yields more cane sugar than any other island and at times produces as much as two billion pounds in one year sugar cane was introduced about twenty-five years after the landing of columbus and cuba has had sugar plantations from that time to this many of the sugar estates are owned by wealthy men who employ large capital to run them some have mills which grind a thousand tons of cane in twenty-four hours and some estates have railroads upon them to carry the cane from the fields to the factory some have so many laborers that the houses on one estate form a little town we see many women among the workers they are planting hoeing and cutting the cane the overseers tell us they work quite as well as the men some plantations have nurseries where the babies and little children are watched over by the old women while their mothers are at work in the fields cuba grows better tobacco than any other country of the world this plant will thrive in any part of the island but the best varieties are raised in the mountainous province of pinar del rio west of havana 
where there is a strip of land about eighty miles long and twenty miles wide which produces the finest tobacco of the world it is so fine that it commands very high prices the choicest leaves bringing as much as four dollars a pound tobacco is usually raised on small farms for it requires great care and labor the plants are grown in beds from seeds so small that you could hold more than a thousand of them in one hand the seeds are sown in september and in six or seven weeks the plants are about eight inches high and ready to be set out this work must be done with great care and by hand after this they are well cultivated and are pruned with the thumbnail as this is less liable to injure them than a knife about january they are almost ripe they have grown as tall as a man and their dark green leaves are turning yellow the stalks are now cut into sections of two leaves each and the sections are hung on poles and carried to the drying sheds where they remain until properly cured after this the leaves are fermented and then made up into bundles the bundles are packed up in bales of one hundred ten pounds each and are thus shipped to all parts of the world about eighty thousand people are employed in cultivating cuban tobacco and in the factories of havana and other cities a vast number are engaged in manufacturing it into cigars and cigarettes the crop amounts to many million dollars a year end of chapter fifty nine chapter sixty of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter sixty the bahamas and the bermudas we sail from havana to the northeast going so close to florida that we can see the coast with our glasses the air is warm and the water is warmer than the air for we are traveling through the gulf stream that warm ocean current which flows between banks of cold water through the straits of florida along our atlantic coast there is much seaweed floating in it and we try in vain to catch some by throwing lines out at the stern of our steamer how blue the water is and how beautiful it is smooth most of the time and our ship cuts its way through it leaving a long track behind now we are approaching the bahamas a group of many little coral islands belonging to great britain they have altogether an area about the size of connecticut and a population of only a few thousand souls it was upon one of them san salvador that columbus landed when he discovered the new world we pass the green island of andros and a little later see the palm trees of new providence rising above the white buildings on the harbor of nassau andros is the largest of the bahamas but new providence is the most important nassau being the capital we land and stroll about the town admiring its cozy houses and beautiful gardens most of the people we meet are blacks and mulattoes although there are some whites including many english and americans who have come here for their health on account of the climate we find the hotel comfortable and after a good dinner take carriages for a drive over the island we visit the queen's staircase a flight of huge steps cut out of the solid rock from one of the forts down to the beach and in the evening take a ride on the lake of fire not far from the city we have all seen lightning bugs fly through the air in this lake there are many little organisms which might be called the lightning bugs of the sea for they seem to coat the water with fire at times when the lake is quiet there is no light whatsoever but at others when it is moving these little organisms emit light just like the lightning bug and the water seems to be flaming as our boat moves it leaves a trail of fire and when a boatman dives down into the water he is apparently outlined in flames much of our stay in the bahamas is spent upon the sea the water is exceedingly clear and boats with bottoms of plate glass have been constructed so that we can look down from them and observe the fishes swimming about we also see great sponges lying here and there on the rocks off the bahamas are the best sponge fishing grounds of the world 
as much as a million pounds of sponges being gathered in a single year the sponges are obtained by divers or by fishing for them with a hook attached to a pole the fishermen have buckets with glass bottoms by putting such a bucket into the water and looking into it they can see clear to the bottom no matter if the water be rough when they spy a good sponge they thrust down their poles catch it with a hook and pull it up when the sponge first comes out it is black and sticky a soft-bodied animal that looks much like a marine plant it is left in the sun a short time while the softer parts decay the skeleton is then cleaned bleached and dried for export sponges are trimmed and sorted before they are sold they are pressed into bales and shipped to all parts of the world another industry of the bahamas including the turks and caicos islands at the eastern end of the group is salt making the sea water is admitted to lagoons or beds so made that the sea can be shut out from them after the lagoons are full the openings are closed when the hot sun soon evaporates the water leaving the salt lying upon the ground there is so much produced in this way that it is gathered up for shipment to different parts of the world the salt is hoed and shoveled into carts by negroes and carried to the ports leaving the bahamas we next call at the bermudas a group of islands somewhat similar to the bahamas lying north of the west indies in about the same latitude as charleston south carolina they also belong to england and are of great importance as a naval and coaling station the english have men of war here ready to start out to defend their possessions and they also have docks and other conveniences for the repair of their navy there is a garrison of english soldiers on the island the bermudas are of coral formation but the soil upon them is so rich and the climate so mild that all sorts of flowers grow luxuriantly geraniums bloom all the year round and one can have roses from christmas to christmas there are oleanders everywhere some so tall that hedges are made of them one of the great crops of the island is lilies which are grown both for their bulbs and for flowers at easter time many of the flowers are shipped to new york and later on the bulbs are dug up and exported bermuda also sends us onions and early potatoes and as these things can be raised here when it is still winter in the united states they bring high prices we stay a day or so at hamilton the capital of the bermudas awaiting a steamer to take us back to our homes we call upon the governor visit the parade grounds where the soldiers are drilling and then ride about on our bicycles looking at one little flower farm after another but all the while longing for the time of our sailing to come at last the hour arrives and we go on board our steamer is turned toward the northwest we have a few days pleasant sailing when we sight sandy hook and a little later on find ourselves landed in new york on our own dear american soil end of chapter sixty chapter sixty one of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter sixty one the islands of ice and snow there are some important islands which we have passed by in our long journey around the world because they are already described in other books of this series we have been forced to omit other unimportant ones on account of their small commercial or industrial value or because they were so far out of the line of our travels the british isles we visited while we were traveling in europe the japanese archipelago and hong kong we saw when in asia tierra del fuego was explored during our tour of the grand division of south america and the seal islands of alaska vancouver and the fishing banks of newfoundland we learned about in our journeys in north america among other interesting islands are these of the great archipelago about the north pole these islands belong to various countries but chiefly to great britain russia and denmark they are in the far north 
vast wastes of ice and snow with icebergs floating about them and with glaciers extending out into the sea they are in the region of long days and long nights where for some months the sun never sets and where for other months it is dark all the day through these islands are inhabited by eskimos and other half-savage people of the same nature who dress in furs and live by hunting and fishing having rude huts built of stone or blocks of ice and snow they have no domestic animals but dogs and reindeer there are many such tribes each having its own customs but all more or less alike the most important of these islands are greenland and iceland which belong chiefly to denmark greenland is by far the largest island on the globe it is about one-fourth the size of the united states without alaska and our outlying colonies and more than three-fourths of it is covered with an enormous bed of ice many feet thick the icy bed is so large that if it could be lifted up and spread over our country it would cover all of our atlantic states with the exception of georgia and florida the ice ends in glaciers at the shores or some distance back from them in the interior it covers mountains and valleys although some of the mountains are more than two miles in height here and there the ocean runs far into the land and at places glaciers or frozen rivers move slowly down to the water breaking off from time to time in great masses with a noise like thunder it is said that more than a billion tons of ice push out from the shores of greenland into the sea every year this vast country is sparsely populated it has altogether only several hundred danes and some thousands of eskimos the danes govern the island they have little trading places along the coast where they bring wheat coffee sugar and tobacco and exchange them with the natives for furs sealskins dried fish and the down of the eider duck some of them have little gardens where they raise lettuce cabbages and radishes in the few summer months the eskimos usually live near the shore they have little huts of stone or turf and in the winter of snow and ice blocks they are hunters and fishers catching seal and walrus the latter animal furnishing a great part of their food they net ducks and other birds and sometimes kill musk oxen and even polar bears they drink melted snow water and do much of their cooking in a rude way with fish oil and blubber they rely chiefly upon their clothing to keep warm sleeping in fur bags at night the men and the women have much the same dress both wearing stockings and trousers of sealskin with the fur turned inward and also skin stockings and boots the men have jackets and hoods of fur and the women sometimes have pouches or pockets sewn to the back of their garments in these the babies are carried until they are old enough to walk the eskimos make boats of driftwood covered with seal skin and also sleds formed of bone wood and skin in which they travel over the frozen ice drawn by dogs they are altogether of a low grade of civilization and of not much importance in the work of the world iceland is not so cold as greenland although it lies only a short distance to the eastward for its climate is tempered by the warm winds from the ocean it is not uninhabitable and it has woods of stunted beech and pastures upon which cattle thrive there are many farms which support sheep and others on which hardy horses are reared iceland is about the size of ohio it is very mountainous and it has enormous volcanoes which have thrown out so much lava that they have covered about one-tenth of its surface there are altogether more than one hundred volcanoes and many hot springs notwithstanding that the country is so far north and that it has great glaciers and vast fields of snow we are especially interested in iceland because it was one of the homes of the norsemen a people who it is claimed discovered america almost five hundred years before columbus made his first voyage across the atlantic the country is now ruled by denmark and is peopled largely by danes most of the natives live by rearing cattle and sheep and by fishing the capital is reykjavik a thriving little city on the west coast here the governor-general lives and here the little parliament which makes the laws has its sitting reykjavik has good schools 
a national library and a museum not far from iceland are the faroe islands twenty-four in number inhabited by people similar to the icelanders who devote themselves to sheep rearing and fishing not very far away from the faroes are the shetland islands noted for their beautiful ponies and nearer scotland are the orkneys and hebrides belonging to that country farther northeast of greenland and inside the arctic circle are spitzbergen franz joseph land and nearer the russian and siberian coast nova zembla the new siberia islands and others most of the latter islands have no permanent inhabitants but they are visited by hunters from siberia who cross over with their reindeer to take advantage of the short grass moss and other kinds of stunted vegetation found there they also go to hunt the bears foxes and other animals which live on the islands passing on eastward and going through the bering strait we find some large islands lying between asia and north america the alaskan archipelago has many islands and islets the aleutian chain and the kuril islands which are largely volcanic are of considerable extent and the great island of sakhalin off the east coast of siberia is six hundred miles long and at one place more than one hundred miles wide this island has valuable coal beds oil fields and gold mines it has luxuriant forests a climate in which grains and potatoes will grow and the waters surrounding it are so rich in fish that it is said the fisheries there will some day be the most important of the whole world sakhalin now belongs partly to japan and partly to russia the northern part of the island is a russian prison settlement inhabited by exiles and convicts sent there to work in the mines the southern part belongs to japan it is noted for its fisheries and its vast forest of fir trees end of chapter sixty one chapter sixty two of carpenter's geographical reader australia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter chapter sixty two islands around and about south america we shall take one more trip before we close our explorations of the great island world as we look over the globe we see that we have visited the waters about australia europe asia africa and north america but have passed south america by south america has however but few island groups near it and none of very great importance with the exception of the archipelago of tierra del fuego about its extreme southern end which we visited during our journeys in south america there are a few islands however which are deserving of mention the galapagos archipelago lying on the equator almost directly west of ecuador in a little group especially noted for its large turtles and the guano islands farther south along the coast are famous for the millions of birds which roost upon them and live and die there making a valuable fertilizer which is sent by the shipload to europe and the united states the guano islands are masses of volcanic rock rising out of the ocean opposite the great desert of western south america the rain never washes them and they are bare of everything green the birds live on the fish of the waters about many of them are pelicans which have great bills with pouches under them in which they scoop the fish up out of the water eating until they can eat no more they then climb upon these islands and lie about until they have digested their food there are also vast flocks of seagulls and other birds which bring the fish they catch to the islands and sometimes seals crawl up out of the water and die upon them this has gone on for ages and since there is but little rain a great mass of manure accumulated which was so valuable that nearly all of it has been mined and carried away in ships bringing into the people of peru to whom the islands belong many millions of dollars south of the guano beds and farther west is an island belonging to chile which is especially interesting to us it is known as juan fernandez 
and is the island upon which alexander selkirk the sailor whose adventures inspired the story of robinson crusoe was cast away selkirk had fallen out with the captain and mutinied and he was given the choice of being hanged or left alone on this desert island he declined the hanging and was landed with a small supply of provisions he lived all alone on the island for four years and four months when an english war vessel attracted by his watchfires called and took him to england while there he wrote the story of his adventures and it is supposed that it was this story that suggested to daniel defoe the tale of robinson crusoe although defoe having a better knowledge of the islands and the southern part of the caribbean sea has made his story to correspond to them in its descriptions of scenery products and plants it is but a short distance from juan fernandez to valparaiso the chief port of chile and from there one can get ships which will take him down through the strait of magellan to the falklands about two hundred fifty miles east of the south american continent these islands are farther south than any other place we have visited in our tour but owing to the warm ocean currents flowing by them the grass is green all the year round the islands all told have only about two-thirds as much land as massachusetts but they support hundreds of thousands of the finest sheep and more than half a million dollars worth of wool is exported every year the falklands are about the windiest islands on the globe the cold winds blow every day and almost all day long they blow so hard that not a tree can live and the people say that potatoes are sometimes blown out of the ground it is always cloudy there the air is moist there are many swamps and nature is dreary the falklands are owned by great britain and their people are nearly all scotchmen the capital port stanley is a little town of seven hundred inhabitants with english churches and schools and cottages not unlike our own houses the shepherds live in little huts at wide distances from one another so that a child has often to ride five or ten miles if he would have a game with his next-door neighbor they are so far apart that they cannot have schools like ours so the government furnishes travelling schoolmasters who go from one shepherd's home to another to teach the children the teacher stays with each family a fortnight and then having laid out a course of study he goes on to the next family which may live twenty miles away after a time he gets back to his old pupils and examines them on what they have studied during his absence below the latitude of the falklands there are several small islands claimed by various countries but none of commercial importance with the exception of tierra del fuego there is no other land so far south of the equator that has any value whatever the falklands are the farthest south of all commercial and industrial regions end of chapter sixty two end of carpenter's geographical reader australia by frank carpenter